The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Alrighty, so, um, hello, my name is uh, Randall Kent. Uh, today we're just going to talk about um, getting started with Drupal services. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm an Atlanta native, born, raised, educated, everything Atlanta, um, all within like the metro area too. So uh, I've been Drupaling since Drupal 4 point something. I've forgotten the something through all the Drupal cons I've been to, um, but that's okay. It's, uh, it's been a good time. And when I'm not Drupaling, I'm the father of a puppy. I enjoy gardening, and I enjoy doing philanthropic type things uh, in really every sense of the word. Um, so a little bit of context or whatever about what we're doing in this session or whatever. We're going to talk about the basics of REST, um, installing and configuring the services module, uh, as well as managing the nodes via uh, REST API. Um, and so if we consider Drupal services this iceberg here, um, we're going to be right about there uh, on the very top. So we're just going to scrape the surface because Drupal services is really powerful. You can do a lot with it. And this is kind of just to wet your whistle, get you excited, and go out and try, try something with it. So we all know Drupal has lots of cool stuff. Um, you know, you've got nodes, you've got users, you've got the ability to uh, create a lot of this within a GUI. You don't have to write code to do some of this. Um, and then these terms that I've used here are specific to the services module, which we'll get into. That's why it might kind of look a little weird or whatnot. But so you've got all this stuff within the Drupal box. And maybe, you know, you're a third party and you want to use some of that stuff, but you're not, you're not a part of the site, or you're a third party that maybe wants to feed you information or get information from you and do stuff with it. Well, that's kind of where um, the services module comes in. And the, I guess there are kind of three letters that are very important in making that happen, uh, and that is going to be API. So API is application programming interface or whatnot. And in the context of the web, you've got uh, web services, web API, I guess are some common terms. And with regard to the web and kind of what exists out there, you've got, you know, a REST, XML RPC, and SOAP. Um, SOAP, I hope, goes away. XML RPC, I could see going away and be happy with. But um, REST is, is, in my opinion, kind of where it's at. Uh, so that's why this talk is going to go into REST and then how, how, to, how to use it. So quick overview about REST. Um, it's uh, built on HTTP, which kind of ties to the bottom one, uniform interface, but just work with me here. Um, so it's built on top of HTTP. Uh, the gentleman that kind of is the father of REST is very involved in writing kind of the uh, standards that are around HTTP 1.0, 1.1. And so it's, it's kind of, it sits on top of that. So you have um, kind of a client server, or rather, we'll explain how it sits on top of it. So you have a resource, um, which would be a URL. So you'd call uh, www.google.com slash something. That's going to be your resource. And with that resource, you interact with it with a method. So you've got the get, post, uh, put, and delete are kind of how you're going to interface with it. So if you've got a git, that is essentially what happens when you type it in the URL bar and you hit enter. You're sending a git HTTP request, and you're getting back um, typically HTML that's then rendered by, by your browser. So a post, often done by a form. Um, and that kind of lets you send some information to the server that it needs to do something with, uh, maybe create a new something. Uh, and then put is similar to post, but not so much. It's um, in the context of Drupal services, it's used to update. Uh, and then delete, um, I think we know what that one does. 
So <clears throat> there is a client-server model uh, that's sort of inherent in, in REST. And what that does is that separates uh, sort of the data storage from the user interface. So you've got your data storage, which in the context of this talk would be everything that's in your Drupal installation or whatever, and then your user interface or whatnot would then be the client, so you can kind of interface with it however you want. Um, what's cool about it is it allows evolution. So you're exposing your data to something else, and you don't know what's going to happen with it, um, and oftentimes a lot of cool stuff happens with it. So uh, that's kind of the client server idea. Stateless means that there, there aren't, uh, there, there's no state, there's no session. Um, and this is where Drupal services REST server becomes not RESTful because if you have to authenticate um, in order to do something, it sends you back your little session cookie and you're supposed to send that back each time. But we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and you know, just work with it because you can have a REST-like without having completely RESTful and that's most APIs that are out there that call themselves REST APIs are REST-like, uh, REST not necessarily, necessarily RESTful. Um, cacheable. That means that since it runs on HTTP, anything you use to cache a website or whatever can be used to cache whatever's going to be returned by your API. So this um, really helps improve some of the bad things about a REST API because there's a lot of overhead. It's stateless, so you have to send all the information that's necessary to process that request to the API, have it do its work, send it back. And there's a lot of overhead with that. Um, but caching can help. On the flip side, it can also hurt you because if you have stale data, then you know everybody's familiar with that sort of uh, trouble. But it's I consider it to be a pro to uh, REST. Layered is another sort of aspect of a REST API. What this means is that you can have your client call to what it thinks is a server, and then have that server actually be a client requesting to another server. So you can kind of like layer it like that. And since it's, it's uh, it, how do you say, I guess it's transparent to the end user. So if you're pulling a bit of information and in order for that server to get that information in whatever it needs, it might call somewhere else, pull that information back, and then spit everything back to you. Um, and then uniform interface kind of goes back to the idea of it's built on HTTP. So you're, I guess, you, you gain a lot from that. So when you're making a call to the API, you might get back an error code, or rather a response code of 200 saying, OK. And that just means that, all right, what you asked to happen did happen. Um, you might get back you know, a 403 or a 406. Or the different HTTP error codes are sort of what give you a response or tell you what's going on within the, uh, within the API. So that's kind of a very brief overview of REST as a whole. Are there any questions about REST? No? Nope. Has anybody here used the REST API before, the RESTful API? What, what did you use it for? Just curious. OK. No, just a REST API with anything. Twitter, yeah. Yeah, so all kinds of, there's APIs out there for everything. So. Anyway, um, so we talked about REST. We're going to show how to kind of get everything set up. And I'm going to walk through that really step by step. Um, and I had planned on using kind of a remote environment for this, but the internet's just not, not been very cool. So I'm going to use maybe a local environment for that. Um, and I was also going to have a piece of the presentation where you guys could go on and essentially take or create your own HTML form if you had a laptop and submit to it and have it go to the API, but I don't think that's going to happen. We'll see. So anyway, we'll, uh, we'll kind of dive right into the demo. And if anybody has any questions as I'm going along, just stop me and, and ask because that's what it's about. All right, so 
just pop open a not that. Yeah, pop open a little terminal window. window. Make it bigger so you guys can hopefully see. And I, I have like some bash scripts that I use that kind of just help me get things up and running real quick. So that's things like um, adding a virtual host and kind of setting up the um, host's entry so that it knows that that's gonna, that that should be routed back to, uh, to the machine. Um, so we'll do add vert. And that's fine because I just cleaned up my web root before I did this and hopefully Apache restarted without an issue. Um, so we can find out just by kind of browsing to it. Yep, okay, so we're good. Uh, Apache's up and running. Um, the next thing that we're gonna need is obviously a database. And again, this is not necessarily relevant to what we're doing, but it just is showing you kind of how to get going from square one. This is another script that just creates a database. Um, or it doesn't. We'll just pretend like it did, see what happens. You can use Drush to download Drupal. And again, I'm gonna hope this, this, that this works, because it's the internet. Mm. Okay, so what I would typically do is use Drush to download Drupal, um, and then use uh, Drush to install Drup Drupal using the site install command. Drush is amazing. I think there's a session after this. If you're not familiar with it, please like check it out because it's phenomenal how much time it can save you. Um, and then once Drupal's installed, I, okay. We're just gonna jump ahead because I don't think it's worth everybody's time to wait on that. So this is the install I did earlier. Um, and so what I did is uh, created a basic content type uh, called contact. Um, to kind of give you a little frame of reference of how I found myself using Drupal services, we had a client that wanted to have a bunch of different providers, third parties, design landing pages and run advertising campaigns to get people, to drive people to these, to these landing pages and they wanted to kind of aggregate all of the responses and aggregating them in spreadsheets um, really wasn't, wasn't what they were looking for. Uh, so what we did is we're, obviously we, we hooked up uh, with uh, Drupal services and that kind of made it easy because um, we actually abstracted it one layer two, which is what I did here as well, uh, so that they don't have to know anything about Drupal credentials or anything, so they just call an API Send, they, they post some data, it parses it, sends it to Drupal, and then you can see it. Um, so anyway, uh, we'll look at the, you know, just the content type that I set up real quick, just to kind of give you a little bit more information. So it just, it has one field, um, email. So it's just name and email to keep it kind of simple so that we can you know, really see what's going on and know how to, how to use this without a lot of noise. Um, and then, you know, whoa, that's wild. Oh my goodness. Hold on one second.
Okay, cool. Um, sorry, that would just bother me the rest of the whole presentation because I wouldn't know where I was. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, we've, we've, got, we've got that set up. Um, we installed services using Drush, uh, just Drush DL services and then enable it. Um, and it will download uh, a couple dependencies that it has, uh, takes care of it without a problem. There's also a YAML li library that, need, that it needed, um, and it is Googleable, so it tells you what you need. You Google it, it shows you, you download it, put it where it tells you, um, and you're good to go. Uh, so then, and I guess that's rather part of uh, downloading and enabling the REST server. Um, and then you just enable the REST server, and from there, uh, I was clearly cached because I never remember to. Um, like, ever, if something breaks, it's usually the cache, at least in my personal experience. So it's like a habit to just drush CC all, probably a little too much. Um, all right. So what that does is once those two things are enabled, you now have services, uh, which appears under structure. And from here, you can, you can add at an endpoint. And this is just kind of like a point that, or it creates a URL that somebody can reference to you know, access your, your API that you're doing here. Um, so you name it whatever you'd like. Uh, the server, we're gonna select REST because that's the server that we, uh, the module that we enabled. Um, and then the endpoint is actually what they would connect to. So we are at uh, Drupal services um, Drupal.services, rather, so the endpoint would be whatever's after that, so Drupal.services slash something. Is that good size for everybody? Okay, sweet. Um, and then session authentication, uh, I, I just said no, because keep it anonymous, keep it simple. We want to get the concepts, and then we can dive deeper if, uh, if you need to. So, whoops. We'll go to the, just take a look at the service that I already set up. I just called it test service. Um, and if we go to edit resources, it's kind of the, the next step. Um, and here, you can see we've got those things that were in that Drupal box before. So we've got comment, file, node, system, taxonomy, user, all kinds of good stuff. Uh, and this basically says what's going to be exposed to this via this endpoint. Um, and you can, you know, kind of go a little bit deeper. Uh, with how exactly you want people to be able to access it or whatnot. Um, and one very important thing to note about the services module is it inherits all of Drupal security. So even though we're not, we're doing like anonymous stuff here, like we said, you know, don't, don't worry about all that login nonsense. Um, if you're anonymous, if anonymous users don't have permission to create content or do whatever you want them to do with content, it's going to turn back uh, in, in air. So that's just something probably worth noting. Um, and then also, under the server tab, uh, you can select what kind of response formatters you want. So how do you want users to be able to pull information? What formats do you want that information to come back in? Uh, as, well, as, well, as well as the request parsing. So um, services have changed considerably since we initially did this. So when I was preparing for this talk, I had literally went back and started from the beginning because uh, it's, you know, it's a little bit different, a lot, lot similar. So one of the things that I had to do was enable this uh, application uh, your www form URL encoded, because um, that's kind of the format that the code that we wrote before uses. Um, so yeah, that is all set up. And as we can see, there we go. Um, the endpoint for this is just my API. So if we go to it says that, okay, cool, your endpoint has been set up successfully. Um, that's fantastic. Uh, and since, I guess, to access the information that uh, is defined under that resources, you would just do like slash node, for example and that pulls you a list of your nodes. Um, and before, you used to have to adjust like the, the headers in order to change the way that the information comes back. Now it's cooler and you just sort of do like dot JSON and it returns JSON. You want YAML if you're one of those smoothie people. Um, you can do that. Uh, it works, just not here. 
Where did you see that now? Um, the well, you just yeah. No, no, the default, you're, I see what you're saying. Um, I would imagine you could. Uh, I haven't um, just because, I don't know, haven't, uh, haven't really tried or anything. Uh, the code that, that we wrote, it, it, told it, it told the endpoint that it wanted uh, JSON using the headers. And so this is kind of a new feature that I haven't really played around with much. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, so if we look at like a REST console, which is just kind of like a debugging tool, um, this is a one for Chrome that I've not used uh, until recently. Um, in the past, I've always used a poster for Firefox. Um, but this seemed kind of cool, so I thought I'd, I'd try it out. Uh, and it kind of just gives you a way to uh, adjust the headers. <coughs> Excuse me. There we go. Um, so it's, it's the exact same kind of thing. You know, you're going to request node. You want JSON coming back. Um, if you hit git, you get this thing. Um, and then if you wanted a um, particular node, you could just say, you know, give me the node ID one or whatever, and mm, I must have broken something. That's unfortunate. Oh, no. Yeah, I cleared out everything before I did this. So yeah, um, there's always a reason why you get errors. It's just whether or not you see it. Thank you. So yeah, if you hit get, you get the entire node back at you. Um, all kinds of good stuff. Uh, JSON's my favorite. I'm a, J I'm a JavaScript guy. I like do the meetup group in Atlanta for JavaScript. So if you're ever in the area, and we're doing a meetup. We do one twice a month, uh, workshop.js, which is like hands-on kind of stuff. And then we do like a general one, um, cool, cool stuff. Anyway, completely sidetracked. Um, and then it gives you, you know, the, the path to, to where you're going. Um, and you can really easily create nodes, you know, through, the, through this. Um, Uh, I'm just going to set the payload that goes across. So what's actually going to be posted? Um, you got to send it the title. This is new. And we'll send it the, uh, I'm sorry, the type. And then the title. Very basic example here. So if we do a post, um, we get back uh, the node ID, which is 21, as well as the URI of that um, through the um, through the API. So if we go there for more information or whatnot, we see that you know the the path of that node is this, and if we go to that, um, we see the node that we just created. Um, and if we wanted to update this, for example, like this is new, uh, we're at node ID 21, we can come back to the REST console, um, change, I'm gonna minimize that, it's huge. Um, this is new, we'll say, whoa. And if we do a put to node 21, We'll hopefully get a, um, so it returns this, means it's okay. If we look at the response headers, we'll see the status code's 200, um, which is, tells you that, another way to tell that it's, that it's okay. Yes, it did just update, sorry. Um, <laughs> and so if we refresh that node, we'll see that the title's changed. Um, and so all of this is just done kinda, kinda through the API. Uh, any questions so far on this stuff? 
Is it making sense? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the the term node is just something that they've picked up from uh, the fact that that's what they used to be. Um, so I'm pretty sure anything that you want to work with, like any entity or whatever, you can definitely work with. I personally haven't, um, but I would imagine that 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 would make sense for me if I were uh, a query. A query. Right, right. That is honestly something that's going to be a limitation. Um, uh, again, this is something that, that we haven't needed to do. Um, but the idea with REST is that you pull back a whole bunch of information, and then you work with it internally. And so that's why when you just access the endpoint, it returns everything. And then you can kind of dive deeper into it. Um, so querying is not really, you know, it's, it is, but it isn't. Um, the idea behind REST or whatever. Yes, um, unless you know what you're going for. Uh, and, and that's the idea of how if you request like slash node, you get like a list, and then you can kind of go down from there. Um, I'm, I would imagine there's some sort of querying ability. Um, uh, I'm curious if there's views integration, honestly, because that would you know make it super easy. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sorry, the, the I missed questions. I didn't repeat them back. Um, but the question was, can you query it? And it's somebody had mentioned that yes, you know, the, an easy uh, one way to do it would be through views. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's the kind of the kind of basics there. Um, I guess. What I'll show now is, wow, it's big. All right. Um, or rather, uh, so the, the way that we kind of used services or whatever was we set up an API in the middle, um, and it uses this Drupal REST.php, which is just a very small helper class um, that the main reason for using it was to persist the session. So you log in, you get that cookie, you save that cookie as a part of that object, and then you're able to just use it again and again and again. Um, and so this is on GitHub, and there's a link to it in a slide coming up here. Um, but it's, I don't know, it's cool. It helped me a lot. Um, and I also wrote one for um, in C sharp, C sharp .net, because we have to integrate with other things. Um, no, this this is yeah. This would actually be the file. This is the the helper class or whatever. This API or whatever is what you would actually call. Um, so it it requires that helper class, and then from there um, creates the uh, object, and then takes, again, this is really bad code, it's just to show you, you know, you don't want to obviously have that use post like that, um, but it's kind of like, it just shows you that you can abstract it a little bit further. Um, and then so, well <coughs> each of these is its own little virtual host, and I did that to show you that, you know, they don't have to be on the same box. They're just by coincidence on the same box because we're doing a presentation and it's local. Um, so you could have them really be anywhere. Uh, and so what, you know, what we do here is we're just defining uh, the endpoint and then we are uh, creating kind of the structure of the node and then calling the create node just sends the whole thing off to the endpoint. Um, and then static page, is where the end user would be. Um, and so if we just look at the code behind that, we see it's, it's just a form. And it's, call, it's posting the data to the services.api slash api.php, which is that other script that we just looked at. And it's got name and email, create node. So this would be essentially what we gave to uh, the vendors. Uh, <laughs> 
just as kind of a, you know something that they could work with. You could, this was the idea of you know you, if you put this form on your machine and had it call whatever the API was, you would be able to just add nodes or whatever. Um, so if we do Randall, hit create node. It, um, I had it return kind of everything that comes back. So we're seeing the same thing, gives you the node ID, the URI to it. Um, and then I have a little link here that takes you to where that is. Um, and so again, if we want to check it out, we've got it here. Um, So yeah, you can, you can kind of send that everywhere um, and then everything comes back to you. The kind of the next step that we are probably going to be taking with this um, is to tie it together with Node, Node.js, because Drupal um, 7 is a lot faster for creating nodes, but it still sucks um, when you've got a lot of stuff happening at the same time. It kind of bogs down and we had one case where there were so many people hitting it, like once they submitted the form, it was taking like a minute or two for, for it to actually create the node and return the thank you message to the user. So the idea that we are gonna be moving towards is offloading the initial response to um, node so that it can just return back, all right, cool, we got it, and then process essentially like a queue or whatever um, to actually create the nodes. So it'll be close to real time, it'll be, client will be happy, they're not dealing with the with spreadsheets. Um, so yeah, let's see. How does what handle dates? The yep. Mm -mm. Not at all. Like if you look at, it's as if, if you've ever worked with a node in a module or like with PHP, that that object or whatever it's it's the same, so I mean it just it's exposing that in a different way, so everything that you want to do or whatever you know can can be done. Um. So anyway, the the helper class that I had there it's on GitHub um, under me probably needs to be updated, but uh, it's there, and kind of the. Going from here, if you're interested, the project, obviously, drupal.org slash project slash services. Um, follow the links on there to, to read about the REST server and whatnot, uh, and all the other servers, because REST is just what I prefer. It, you know, you can do whatever with it. Um, and then, uh, last but not least, definitely, you know, provide feedback, uh, hopefully positive. If it's negative, don't provide it. Keep it to yourself, no, just kidding. Um, and that link goes to that the same place that everybody else has been saying, but I don't like letters and like that, so I created a bit.ly to go to their thing. So anyway, uh, Drupal Camp Charlotte. Um, sorry, did the person that created that in this room? No. Okay. <laughs> I, was, I was about to like just turn right. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, but yeah, anywho. Um, so yeah, that's that. Uh, I'm on Twitter, Randall Kent, my email. Um, is is that so? Any questions or anything I can do? So the link that was earlier, can I just send the QR code to? Mm-hmm. Yes, it's by the end of the meeting. Mm-hmm. It is. So it's a really pretty nose. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, like for example. Exactly, exactly, and that, yes, that was part of the, uh, but yeah, if we go down here to do by, bypass access control, I just check that box just to make it easy, um, er, easier. Um, so yeah. Is it only inbound, I mean, can you talk to services externally? Um, Push off a SOAP commit or you know, 
Sure. No, oh, no, you did not. I'm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. No. The right. The I guess the idea again is that it's everything that you can do with within like a module or whatever you can do through services. So when you create a node, then that would trigger whatever happens on node save. So everything. No, no, you could use rules. That, yeah, because that's how. The, yeah, that's how it works. So, is there a rules integration with the services API? Um. In. Right. Yeah. Um. If if you're if you're going to be, I guess you want it to when when you do something to make a call yeah, externally. Update or save to send over to the API to inject it in their system. Um. You might could do that, <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, you'd have to. I mean, it it's it's more meant to expose what's inside and let you do what you want it to do. Um, but you can definitely extend it. You can definitely have uh, kind of it act as a as a client. So that whole layered idea of client server client whatever, um, you you can do that. But likely you're going to need to code something somewhere along the lines, which is cool because REST makes it. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch. 
where they would spin up, uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. And then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the cloud stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astro Space systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Astro or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Astro. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.